Champion women, it's time to get ready for this year's most exciting women's event, Speak Fierce Love 2022. This year's speakers include our own Pastor Lucinda Bloomfield, Pastor Pam Hart, and Real Talk Kim. Be sure to invite your friends and get your tickets now for this two-day conference coming March 18th and 19th. Welcome this morning to Women's Morning. Give a girl a hug in the room. I wish I could hug those of you who are watching today. Welcome, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. We're going to have a little bit of fun in the Word of God. We're going to grow together in strength and in power. God has been so faithful to his girls. He loves you so much. He's so good to all of us. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. In spite of all the viruses crawling around and making us cough and sputter and in the hospital and who knows what else, you're here today and you're here watching today by screen. I love you all. I know that there's a few precious people fighting for their life who watch us live. And if you're with us this morning, you just hold on and be strong and just know that Jesus is fighting for you and with you. And if you're in pain today, if somebody's in pain, I remember when I was in such a desperate, desperate pain, and I would pray sitting on the toilet. I know I look all awesome now, but I was on the toilet because I had ulcerative colitis, and it was out of control, and I went into an acute attack. And so in the process of trying to get well, I went to the bathroom over 18 times in one day, and I lost count, and I was in so much pain, and I was bleeding, and it was so horrible and awful, and I had my little boys and my precious husband and a church called Faith Christian Center in Canada, and I was just like at the bottom of the bottom, sitting on the toilet crying with my eyes closed, and all of a sudden, I felt the Lord take me to this beautiful, cool place, and it was cool, and it was quiet, and there was a big tire swing. And I walked over to that tire swing, and I got onto that swing. And in my, in my spirit, in the vision, in where God literally took me as I was in pain and crying, this tire swing would go like this, and I would feel it in my body. It would make my insides feel good. It gave me strength. It was cool. It was beautiful. Stephen there was there, Pastor Stephen. He was pushing me, and we were going back and forth. And then I looked at my two little blonde-headed boys, my little Canadian boys, half American, half Canadian, half New Zealand, half new whatever. They're from all over the world. They're salsa kids. They got, you know, 57 flavors, and we're going all around and up and down. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Every time I would get into that place where I felt like I just couldn't do another thing, I would be right there on that tire swing. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And I always tell people, when you're going through pain, when you feel like you can't do this, I can't do it, you just close your eyes and say, Jesus, take me somewhere. I've taken people all kinds of places. I've said, where is Jesus taking you right now? Come on, where is he taking you? And people will say, I'm down on a cool cruise. I feel like crying because I've been with so many people when they felt like giving up. I've been with people when they feel like they just can't do it and their Savior will take them somewhere. Jesus will take you somewhere. He'll minister to you. I said, where are you walking? Oh, I'm walking in a field and there's flowers everywhere and they're beautiful and I can smell the flowers and the sun is so warm on the flowers. It's making them more fragrant than they naturally would be. Oh, how beautiful is that? Where is Jesus taking you? Oh, I'm up. I'm on a cliff and I'm looking looking out over and I can just see this huge, I can't tell you how many places I have been able to minister to people. Where is Jesus taking you to minister to you? Girls, he's always there with you and he's always fighting for you. He will take you where you need to go to strengthen your spirit, to refresh your soul. You're never alone. He's always with you, but you got to participate with him. You got to be vulnerable with him. You got to let your guts hang out and let him do what he wants to do inside of your spirit. 
After those moments when people experience that, there's a fresh wind that they have to fight the battle that's going on in their body, to fight the battle that's going on in their emotions, to fight the battle. One time I went to see a beautiful girl. She was young and she had a mental illness and it went out of control and she was, uh, you know, doing bad things and wanting to hurt herself. And this was in Canada and they took me into this padded place. I had never been in anything like this. And literally they are true. It's not just on TV. She had on like a, what they call a straight jacket. So she couldn't hurt herself. It was real, and the, the cell that she was in was padded, and there was no blanket because she could hurt herself. And I went in there. Her name was Mary, beautiful little Mary. I said, Mary, it's Pastor Lucinda. And she looked at me with these glassy eyes because they had so many meds in her. And I said, sweetie pie, let's pray. Jesus wants to minister to you. And I began to pray with her, and we began to just pray together. And she said to me, oh, I feel Jesus. He's taking me up high and we're flying and, and I feel strength and I feel like I'm a bird. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be this amazing, perfect. What is it for you? She felt like being like, like a bird that Jesus was flying with her. It lifted her up out of this earth and this world and these problems and her emotions. And she felt like she could have strength to fly and to soar. I said, that's it. You're soaring like wings of eagles. Yes, I am. That's what I'm doing. And it was about two weeks later, precious Mary got out and she was whole and she was struggling to think straight and struggling to have meds work for her and and trusting Jesus. Listen to me, beautiful girls. Jesus is with you always. And that's not even what I plan to speak about today. So let's get started. If you have your Bibles with me, open up today to 2 Kings 4. I think you're going to love this today. 2 Kings 4, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, your servant, my husband is dead. You know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. Now listen, this woman is the woman of a minister You could say he was a pastor, but he was a prophet. And he would have most likely, since she said, Elijah, you know him. Now listen to me. We talk about the spirit of Jezebel all the time, right? Oh, this is the spirit of Jezebel in the church. Oh, Jezebel this and Jezebel that. Jezebel was somebody you don't mess with. Jezebel was raised under a, uh, under a, um, uh, a priest of Baal. He was like the head priest. It's like, if you have a king of Israel, he was the head priest of Baal. Who's Baal? Baal is the God that they worshiped like a satanic god named Baal. They sacrificed to Baal. I'm not even going to tell you all the bad things they did, but Jezebel was raised in the art of Baal worship. She was the priestess's daughter. She was the priestess of a priest. She was his daughter. She was groomed. She was masterfully trained to be a manipulator, to do things that only priestesses do. You can read all about it. I'm not even going to talk about it. It was so horrible. They worshiped Uh, gods of fertility and and Ashtar. And I mean, when you look at who Jezebel was, honey, she was nobody to mess with. And everybody wants to talk about the spirit of Jezebel, but nobody wants to talk about, I've never once, I've been in church for, I've been a pastor's wife for 36 years. And before that, I was a little traveling evangelist with my little dummy doll, Tecla, all over Southern California, married a pastor, been in pastoring now for 36 years. I want to tell you something. I have never heard this. I have never heard, well, there's a spirit of Ahab in the church because Ahab, the king of Israel, who knew of God, who was raised as an Israelite, who was raised to love God, but he chose not to love God, he married Jezebel. Nobody ever wants to talk about the spirit of Ahab who let Jezebel in. Jezebel only was Jezebel because she was raised to be Jezebel. It's like having a snake on the ground. I'm sure you've heard this story. There's a snake. It's cold. There's a woman with a big sweater and a big jacket on, and she's all warm. And the snake says, I'm cold. Could you let me in your jacket? I want to get warm. No, you're a snake. I'm not going to let you in my jacket. Oh, but it's so cold. Please let me in your jacket. No, you're a snake. You're going to bite me. Oh, but I'm so cold. Let me in. All right. So you pick up the snake, and you put him in your jacket be warm, and he bites you, and you, ah, you bit me. You knew who I was when you put me in your jacket, okay? 
So Jezebel now, she's led into the people of God and she is going to do what she has been raised to do and that is worship Baal and mix him in with God's people and before long, King Ahab has now mixed in Baal worship with also the worship of God in the temple of God. It is absolutely horrible. And all we want to ever talk about is Jezebel. Well, what about the spirit of Ahab who lets it in? Right? So guess what Jezebel decides to do? She gets mad at Elijah. She gets mad at God because Baal is the God of storms. He's the God of the weather. He's the God they worship when they need to have their crops watered. He's the God they worship when they want to have sun come out. He's supposed to be the one who's controlling the weather. And so she's now worshiping Baal, and she's mad that now there's a drought in the land. And she gets mad at Elisha for that. And so she sends her people out to go, I'm going to kill those prophets. She sends these people out, and they go, and they kill the prophets of God. But thank God there was a man who took all of these men and he separated them as quickly as they found out about it. You can read all of this. I'm going through a story very quickly. 50 in one, ca uh, one cave and 50 in another to spare as many as they could. But in the middle of it all, Jezebel wiped out many of God's prophets in deep anger towards God and his house. She was an evil girl. She was raised to be evil. It's to say Jezebel is this horrible person, absolutely but she was raised to be that, and Ahab led her in, and now there's prophets that are dead. So this woman now, she comes up to the man of God. She comes up, and she says to him, servant, I want you to know that my servant, my husband, he's dead, and you know all that he has done. He's revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. Elijah replied to her, how can I help you? And today the Holy Spirit wants to say to you in your need, how can I help you? He wants to say to you today, how can I be a help to you in your need? And then it goes on to say, your servant has nothing, nothing at all. And I think sometimes God wants us to assess our lives and say, what do we have to reveal that we actually think we don't have anything? My marriage is ruined. I don't have anything. No, no, no. What do you have? I have nothing. It's over. I just can't do this, right? I can't raise these kids. I can't wear a mask another day in my life. We have another variant. Oh, my gosh. And we get, we get like crazy, right? Like, I have nothing left. How many of you ever feel that way? Sometimes I, feel, I just have nothing left. But God wants you to realize, oh, no, you have something. And so the word of God tells us, she says, I have nothing at all, she said. Oh, but except I do have a very small jar of oil. I have a little jar of oil. So she goes and she gets her little tiny jar of oil. You see, there's always something when God says, what do you have? He just wants you to look around and realize, oh, no, you have something. God never, ever leaves you without something. Just as I started when I had nothing, I'm in my little thin nighty sitting on the toilet again, 18 times and counting. How can I do this? I have nothing left. Yes, you do. I'm going to take you somewhere amazing. It doesn't have to be on earth. It could just be in your spirit. It doesn't have to be something that you, it's actually tangible. It could just be something that's in your heart, that's in your spirit. Maybe it's something small, but there's always something. If God asks you, what do you have? He's trying to get you to look around and realize he never leaves you without something. Elijah said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it in one side. So put it to one side. She then left him, shut the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the jars to her. She kept pouring when all the jars were full. She said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, now go and sell the oil and pay all your debts, and then your sons can live on what is left. You know, so many times people say that the Bible, that God, that Jesus is pro-slavery, no, he is not. But we got to be honest. 
there are slaves in the Bible. And Jesus remembers everyone from the lowest to the low to the highest of men is who Jesus came for. And the reason why there's slavery in the Bible is because a lot of times people had debts that they could not pay. And the debtors were coming for a payment. And they told her, we're coming back for your sons. And they will pay. And they will work in my fields. And they will do what needs to be done to pay your debt. Now her husband's gone. Now they're coming for her children. What is she going to do? She finds the man of God. And so today, I want you to know something. God will not leave you without an answer. That's why the house of God is here. You stay connected to the house of God, just as she ran to the person of God, to the messenger of God, to the prophet of God. God wants you to run to his house, to where he is, and stay connected to that place. Because in that place is where you find camaraderie. You find the spiritual sister to agree with. You're part of a growth group, a connect group. You're part of a women's morning. You're part of a youth night. You're part of a college night. You come to CR on Monday night, celebrate recovery, and you get off of the things that are addicting you and holding you back. You're connected to God's house and his purpose in your life and what he wants to do. He wants you to stay connected to the flow of what's happening. So she goes to Elijah and says, this is happening in my life. You know my husband. He was a minister. He loved the house of God. He served as a prophet. Help me. What do I do? What do you have? I have nothing. That's how us girls get, don't we? Nothing. I just don't have anything. But God wants to remind you today, there's something, there's something, you have something. So I want to talk to you about, last week we had uh, talked about having that spirit of abundance. And today that this message kind of carries on that spirit of abundance. Because all we need is something small for God to make. I love that old-fashioned song that used to be, little is much when God's in it. Little is much when his hand is on what's going on. Little is much when you trust him in faith and his hand is working in your life. Just a little, just a pinch is all it takes. We know the word of God tells us that all you need is faith as the side of a mustard seed. The smallest, the smallest seed there is is a mustard seed. That's all you need is a little tiny itty bitty. We used to wear necklaces that were round with a little tiny mustard seed inside. And that was our little mustard seed necklace. And we wore those things everywhere. If we only have faith the size of a little teeny weeny, itsy bitsy little tiny mustard seed is all you need for the faith that you need to go through that massive mountain, that big massive challenge, that diagnosis, that bankruptcy, that challenge, that mortgage that needs to be paid. Sometimes we have more month than we do money. And God wants you to know something. He's in it all and he will help you. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging for bread. The word of God tells us ever. So God wants you to do something today. He wants you to close the door and pour. He wants you to close the door and start to pour. Close the door on your negativity. Close your door on the what ifs. Close the door on, well, God forgot about me. Close the door on comparison. Close the door on things that are holding you back from believing God for what he has for you. Close the door and realize that he's working and he has something for you. But if you keep the door of doubt open, if you keep the door of hopelessness open, if you keep the door of I'm not worthy enough for God to do something for me, sweetheart, Jesus paid the price for you. This isn't about how good you are or how bad you are. People say things like, oh, if I ever darken the doors of a church, it'll be my funeral because I'll be down in hell having a party. They say things like this, but that's not true. You are not, you are not what you do. You are who you are and what's inside of you. And when that grows big inside of you, all of a sudden what you do begins to change. I have watched so many beautiful, amazing people trust God when there's been just a little. I remember a beautiful girl came to see me and she had a situation that she had made some, she had made some decisions. And now she came to a point of decision 
do I go through with this or can I go have an easy fix when nobody will know about? Pastor Lucinda, I need to see you. I'm in trouble. This has happened to me, but I could go and do this and it could all be taken care of. And I said, absolutely not because you are making a decision on the now. I know, but I don't have this and I don't have that. And I, can't. And I, I said, God's going to provide. You have nine months to get it all settled, sweetie pie. Nine months for God to show up. You got nine months to see how God's going to pull this all together. That's the awesome thing about having a baby, isn't it? Let's just be honest. It's all crazy in the beginning when mom finds out you're going to have a baby and you're not married. <laughs> right? But she got nine months to get over it and all of a sudden she can't wait to have that grandbaby. Right? You have nine months for God to do some arranging and some things to happen. I have watched this beautiful young girl birth this child. This child is the most precious little thing ever. And it's been so wonderful to watch this little one grow up. But I want you to know something. She poured when there was not much to pour in her life. She started going to school and working full time. I remember when she couldn't pass a certain class, and I said, Pastor Stephen and I are paying for you to take that class over again, and dang it, you better pass it this time, and you better go right up to that person that's leading it this time and say, hey, I failed this class, but you know what? Somebody sponsored this class for me, and I need your help to make sure that I'm going to pass this class because I need this class in order for me to get my degree. And she went and she passed that class and got her degree. Well, so interestingly enough, just the other day, I got a message from her. She's a beautiful person. She's involved. She loves to tell her story. One day I should have her come and tell the story herself. She loves to tell her story, so I'm not saying something she doesn't want you all to know. Believe me, she's an amazing person. She just got offered the most amazing job ever with the most awesome pay, some of the highest pay I've heard of, full benefits, full everything. You know why? Because she poured out, she closed the door, and she poured. And God wants to infuse you today with that same strength that she had where she poured, and she poured, and she trusted God. I love that it says, pour out what you've got, and God will pour more into you. But we often say, no, God, I, I can't pour until I know that it's pouring inside of me. But God wants you to know, I'll pour more when you get more. No, it becomes more when it's poured out. But we have to be careful that our more isn't more bitter, more angry, more sarcastic, more faithless, more against what God wants to do in our life, but we've got to become more ready to pour because he's in the more. He's not in the little. He's not in holding it. Oh, I only have this and I can't pour out. No, today God wants to challenge you to pour out from yourself. Last week, our first point was when God says to give, do it. When he says, give out of yourself, take those shoes off, our beautiful Pastor Jade, who spoke at women's conference last year, she told a story, the most beautiful story. It's in her book. I love her book. I, I, I saw it sitting on her table, and Pastor and I were with the boys one night. This was like last year. And I said, oh, my gosh, look at this. is Jade's book. Oh, my God. I got all excited. And I sat down just like, oh, the kids are in bed, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this book. And I'm like on page three, and I can't even talk to Pastor Stephen without crying because her story was so beautiful because I know where Pastor Jade has come from. She's my beautiful daughter-in-law, and I know where she's come from. And she talks about how she was Miss Yuma County, and when she went to the cancer center, there was a little girl there with no hair on her head, fighting for her life, all in her little tiny shriveled up self, trying to fight cancer, looked down at her pretty fancy shoes, and said, I love your shoes. And Pastor Jade looked down at her Miss Yuma County. She said, you do? Yeah, I love your shoes. She took her shoes off and gave her, that little girl her shoes, walked barefooted through the hospital. But when she got outside, all the other girls, Miss Pima County, Miss whatever county it was, all the counties, Miss Phoenix, whatever, they all picked her up and lifted her up and carried her to the car. And that's what God does when you have little. Pastor Jade remembers moving from house to house. Her beautiful mother who's an amazing nurse. She is such one of the smartest people I know, an amazing girl. But she had to do like the woman with the little and keep up with the little so that God would provide much, so much so that she has a daughter strong enough to stand up and put a crown on her head and represent a city and stand up for the rights and the beautifulness of women and declare Jesus as Lord no matter where she went. 
And because of the little, because that's why I'm so glad my kids didn't get anything. We were pastors. We had like one cell phone for years. We had one car. We had one of everything. We didn't need to have multiples of things to try to be like, oh, we're so successful. We have all these things. No, we just had what we needed to have to get through with what we needed to get through. And I'm so glad my kids weren't just given every little stinking thing they wanted because they've had to work for what they want. They know that feeling of desire. They know that feeling of not being able to have every little stinking thing they want. I would say, to them, sweetie pie, grandmama, and mama, and papa, we're not your Santa Claus. We're not, we're, you, you have a Holy Spirit. You pray to the Holy Spirit, and he'll provide to you what you want. I've watched God give my kids bikes. I've watched him give them computers. I've watched them give my kids cars. I've watched God give my kids things because of their faith, not because of anything amazing, but because of their faith that they believed God when they had little and didn't have a lot. They knew the Savior that they served, and they trusted him. And I'm not just talking about stuff because we don't need more stuff. We need more of God in our life so we can love others who need what we have to offer. How beautiful is it that God is in little because little is much when God is in it. Little is a lot when God is the provider. Little is much. We can't say, oh, I'll pour more when I get more. No, it becomes more because you've poured it out of yourself. You don't say, I'm going to tithe and take care of God's house when I get this. And that's one thing that the text came from the beautiful girl that I was just talking about. She says to me, I've been tithing. I trust God. I serve in the children's ministry. I do this and I do that. This is going to be my job. I said, yes, it is, because you know what? You poured out when you had nothing. And God made much out of the little that you had. And that's how our Savior is. So I want to encourage you today, don't you give up. You keep pouring from yourself. When God says pour out, pour out over your family. When God says give, give out over your family. Watch God multiply. The word of God tells us that this woman went and she sent her sons out, which I used to do to my kids. I bake Christmas cookies, take the cookies all around the neighborhood. I remember the day each of them grew up and said, I'm not delivering those cookies, mom. If you want the neighbors to have those cookies, you have to take them yourself. I'm like, okay. So here's the deal. She sends her sons out and they go and they get all the containers and bring them back and poured and poured and poured. And she took her oil and poured and she poured and it kept pouring and it kept pouring until it was so full and then she goes to the prophet and he says now go and pay off all your debts and live on the rest that's how your God is he provides he doubles he triples he multiplies you have a God of multiplication today don't stop trusting him don't stop believing him because today he wants you to pour out of yourself and not say to yourself oh no not when I get it when my ship comes in when it all works out when it all happens happens when I get the job, when I get the husband, when I have the kids, when I have the this, when I have the following, when I have the likes. No, Jesus says today, today I am here to fill you up. Right now, today, you're worthy of God's goodness. You're worthy of all he has. You're worthy of the little that turns into much. God says today, worthiness is all over you. Blessing is all over you. His presence is all over you. The anointing of God is all over you. And you are not to quit. And you are not to stop. And you are not to give up. You are to fight to the end. So I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, those of you who are with us today on the screen, that you will recognize the blessing of God in your life. You'll see his hand and his goodness around you. You'll begin to walk around and thank him instead of curse what you have, but be thankful for what you have. It may be little and sweetheart. You may be in a mansion and you may be looking around as lonely as you could possibly be, as hurt as you could possibly be. And you know what, sweetheart? Jesus is with you. And he will take the littleness you feel inside and produce much. Because like I say, abundance and wealth have very little to do with your pocketbook. It has everything to do with the richness of your spirit. 
who you are when nobody's around, how you treat people that you don't know, how you carry yourself in a spirit of love and a spirit of honor and a spirit of giving. That's true richness. I have met some of the poorest people in, in dusty places of Cambodia, in Mexico, all around the world I have been. I have met people at the lowest of the low. You would think, and they live in little huts. They might live in little grass shacks. They might live in places, but some of those people are some of the richest people I know because they love much. They may not have stuff, but oh, do they have the presence of God. In the name of Jesus now, my beautiful friend, be blessed. We're so glad you've been with us today. Let's give those who have been watching today a hand. We love you.